The Vietnam War was a war between the northern and southern parts of Vietnam. Northern Vietnam believed in the concept of communism. For this reason, their army was allies with the Soviet Union and China. Southern Vietnam was allied with the U.S. and other non-communist countries. The war began on November 1, 1955 and lasted for 20 years. Though the U.S. was involved at the beginning of the war, President Kennedy increased involvement significantly. Kennedy sent the Green Berets to train Southern Vietnam soldiers in May of 1961. Between 1965 and 1973, more than 540,000 Americans would find themselves involved in the conflict. An estimated 3 million people died during the Vietnam War. The U.S. alone lost about 58,000 men and 300,000 were wounded. The last U.S. troop left Vietnam on March 29, 1973. The Vietnam War took its toll across America. In my town of Frankfort, Kansas, there are a few veterans who had taken part. One of these men is Mr. Bob Reeder. I had the pleasure of interviewing him about his time in Vietnam. At the age of 19, Mr. Reeder came to the realization that he would be drafted. On November 27th of 1967, he showed up and told them he was ready to go and enlisted in the Army. I went up to the... I knew my n number was coming. So I went up to the draft board and said, I'm ready to go. And that's how I got got put in. That was in uh, November 27th is when they inducted me into the service. Raider described basic training as being intimidated at all times. He stated, most men hadn't been away from home much. With not knowing anyone and going through basic training all at the same time, many soldiers kept to themselves. Raider stayed in a room of, with seven other men, not including himself. Arriving in Vietnam was not a pleasant experience. Right after getting off the plane, most people were trying to come to terms with where they were and what was happening. They sent us up to MACB Recondo School that Special Forces ran. And I went through that, and we had to learn how to... We learned everything. But in the mornings, we'd get up, it'd be dark, and we'd do an hour of PT, push-ups, pull-ups, all that. Set-ups, an hour of that. And then you put on all your web gear and a 30-pound sandbag with your weapon and ran seven miles in an hour. Okay. And then, when you did that, then you went to the ocean and treaded water for an hour. Yes. Took your clothes you know, you took everything off, but your clothes, and they took you out in the boat and threw you out there, and you tripped water. Oh, and then God. you went to class. <laughs> and you was in class, and all that was done before 8 o'clock. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And then you went to class, and in the class I learned how to repel. Maps, call in, I could call in artillery, airstrikes, also learn... They taught us real well how to do things like throw knives, mm -hmm. use a piano wire, and we had to be able to take our own blood. You had a syringe and tie yourself off and shove it in your arm. Take take a syringe, take blood, give it to him, and you couldn't pass out. Anything you didn't pass, you were out. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> And everything, and it was pretty crammed. It was, it was uh, 21 days, and then we, the final test, you went out on a mission, and five-man mission. If you came back, you passed. And oh. there were 75 of us started, and there's 35 of us passed, passed final, finally because the guys couldn't. We had guys stick there with their deal. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the reason he did that, we were a small group, five-man missions all the time, or two men. We carried blood plasma on our back. And if you got hit, you were supposed to be able to reach back there, pop it, and give yourself an in give yourself a blood transfusion, more or less. My goodness. Oh, wow. And everything. That's how we was trained and everything. So, but... I think there was, what was there, nine, nine or ten teams went out, and there were three teams that didn't come back. 
they failed. They got killed over there. That was it was a live mission, and, uh-huh. and that was you know, they said. Now, if you want to take a final test, this is, I always said the final test. That's one of the fi- hardest final tests you ever been because if you didn't come back, you flunked and everything, and, and more than just your grade, it was mm-hmm. they, a lot your of them. They never did find mm-hmm. you know the guys. Oh my gosh! No, we ran that final test. I ran. We ran for three days. We got hit right after we got on there, but they were having such a hard time. And we ran for three days before we finally got out of there. Really? So, yep. So that was kind of a one of those final tests that you didn't always remember. Wow. And everything like that. And it, I think I was third in my class of all the stuff. If you just first, they gave you a bayonet. Man, I tried like damn, but didn't get it. <laughs> but, but, and everything. But I was third. There was a Marine and a Rock Marine, and that's a, a Rock Marine is uh, Korea, from Korea. And them two guys beat me. And I was third mm. in the class. So it wasn't bad. Soldiers would be sent on missions throughout Vietnam that would push their mental and physical tenacity to the breaking point. We'd go out for five days and then back in for five. We'd be back in most time for five days. Get, you had to clean your equipment and do all that. See, we were never, most time we weren't making, we, we'd go out and observe. We'd hide and everything. Some days, it was, we'd get close to the enemy and everything. Some days we might not move from here to the highway. Mm. Yeah, we stayed awake for five days. We had pills to keep us awake for five days. Do everything. Oh my gosh. And everything. And some of the missions when we went out while we uh, we ate rice and, and fish heads so we would smell the same. Because you can smell you can smell people. Everybody laughs, but you could actually after you've been in combat stuff, your senses get real good. I can sense them and I, I walk point most of the time and I can mm-hmm. sense them. I feel them or smell them before we ever see them. <laughs> That's everybody always give me give me st- static about that. One of the guys that he's dead now, Kenny Barr. He walked behind me and he said, "I always knew when we was going to make contact because the hair in the back of your neck starts getting up just like a dog." <laughs> so that's really, you know, and a lot of times. People say, how did you do it? And one other guy I'm a real good friend with that was in the same unit, he walked point for the uh, We had a couple teams, and and he was the same way. They said, if you're the point man and you're good, that's what, you, that's what they did. Even if you had to, t- your, if you was the team leader, it didn't matter. You st- I still walked point because I was better than anybody else. Uh-huh. That's what I always figured. So, a little, you know, you, uh, if you thought you was good, but you stayed for what you did. While fighting in Vietnam, raiders soon learned that not only men were part of this war. There's, war is not, there's going to be casualties. And I mean, there's going to be people, that, that kids and children get killed, and there ain't nothing there. It's just that it's, they're there and everything, and that people use them to uh, hide behind over there. Now, and everything over in Vietnam, we had women. You'd see women marching, and they would fight. They had their AK-47s and everything else, and you didn't know who it was until after it was done. The bodies were there, and you go, oh. But, you know, they were shooting at you, so what do you do? Right. Bob Rader is a very well-decorated veteran. Along with his two Purple Hearts, he also received a Silver Star, two Bronze Stars, and a Combat Infantry Badge. His first Purple Heart came from being nicked on the arm. His second one, however, came from being hit by a landmine. The day I got hit, why, there was a chopper up above. A guy by the name of Guy Blue, and he... And we, we were real close to the pilots because if they went down, we went and got them. If 
and everything, and they picked us up and then served us. So we all knew, and they said, guys, drop down. And I wasn't walking point that day. I was letting another guy walk point because I was getting short. In other words, I was getting, <laughs> I had less than, oh, I had about a month and a half left to go before I'd get out of there. Mm. And he, uh, this butler, and anyway, it, they blew it and took his leg off, and then I caught the rest of it from, and everything. And uh, Baloo was up above and seen it, and they secured the area, and he came down. And they loaded me and Butler on the chopper, and I, they shoved me underneath, and I was still conscious and everything. But the uh, funny part about the whole deal was, laying on the back and the medic came up and, and they just looked at me, you know, and, because I was just opened up from all over and they was going to give me a shot of morphine, but he broke the needle and we carried morphine with us and everything and, and broke the needle and if he would have gave me morphine, I probably would have died, but he didn't know that. But when they got back to the deal, to the hospital, they flew us back in and, uh, I didn't know this for quite a few years until I talked to Blue and then a guy that Blue, one of his co-pilots co said they got me back and they said, I remember them guys coming out with a gurney and they said, and they looked at me and they said, where can we, where can we pull him? It looks like we'll pull him apart. And I, I told them, just grab a hold of my hair and pull me off and that's what they did. I figured if my head popped off, I wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> so they pulled me off there and... And I, well, I don't remember too much more than that, but they said, Blue, they said, came in, and they were going to put me over in this under pile where they said, well, he won't survive. And Blue, mm -hmm. guy Blue was pilot, he pulled his pistol and says, you will work on this man. And that's how come I'm alive the best day. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, was, I was dead for about three minutes in my so I've been dead once, so it don't really matter and everything, but that's how, oh my goodness. how I, and then I was in the hospital, and a lot of them, they had curtains pulled because I wasn't supposed to make it and all this, and I was just too damn on to die, my mom said. <laughs> so that was, that was kind of a, one of them deals that George Patton Jr. was my commander over there, and he always told that story about it. he says I walked in there and he said uh, no, you know I can't remember all of it yeah but he says uh, I talked to the doctor and we had this curtain pulled around him and he says is he going to make it doc and he said the patent says and he says doctor says no nope, I don't think he's going to make it and he says he said I raised up and said like blank you doc <laughs> So, so, and Patton used to tell that story all the time. Yeah. You know, we go to reunions and everything, he'd always tell that story on me, so I don't know. You, you know, don't remember doing that? No. <laughs> you know, but knowing me, I might have said it. <laughs> but he was, yeah, and everything, and like that. So, after it got hit like that, well, it was, so I spent three weeks in... Vietnam in the hospital, and then I spent probably a month and a half in Japan in the hospital, and then they flew me to Oakland, California, spent about another two weeks there, and then they finally shipped me to Denver. Like any other soldier, Grader was asked how he would like his family to be notified if something were to happen to him. To which he replied, don't make a big deal about it. I wouldn't want them to worry. When I got hit, see, when you go over, over on combat, they have you fill out this paper. And it says, to your folks or whoever. And I put down, they said, how do you want it if you get hit? And I said, oh, slightly, you know, don't, don't get too excited about it. You know, I didn't want them to worry, so... So, and see, back then, the uh, Sweet Hazlet was caught, and he gets a telegram. 
And he takes that from those folks at 8 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. You know, they didn't mm -hmm. and everything. And of course, Frankfurt, oh, he don't have any arms, no legs, you know. <laughs> because it said, got hit in the arms and legs. Well, and everything. And that was, uh, I know my brothers and sisters said when they went to school, they was all, so he don't have any arms or legs? <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. nobody knew. And then I made a phone call over from Japan the first time. Uh, one of the guys that got hit at the same time sat down beside me, Billy Emanuel. He's a real good friend of mine. He wrote letters home because I couldn't write. Uh, my arms didn't work very good. And he sat there and wrote letters home for me. After returning to the United States, Raider found out that soldiers who had been in Vietnam were not heroes in the eyes of the American people. He was immediately told to change his clothes because people would know. I did down to K-State. If they knew you was in service, they, the girls wouldn't even talk to you. Yeah. Yeah, it, it was mm. pathetic. I mean, they'd, they'd turn around and call you a baby killer and everything else. And just just had no, would not do, wouldn't dance with you, do nothing. Really? Yeah, that was down at K-State and huh. everything. And, uh, and any of your bigger towns, a lot of guys I knew come come with me in the airport they used they said they, people used to spit at them and stuff like that you know mm -hmm. just real real bad stuff and everything bob raider's last day in the service was at a hospital in denver there he was discharged and soon went back home to kansas following his arrival he worked at a trailer factory in manhattan but then went back home to frankfurt to work on the farm he then sold the farm to buy another one and became a mail carrier so how did the or your military experience as a whole affect your life? Uh, like they always say, you you can uh, you know a million dollars worth of worth of experience, but I wouldn't want to do it again. You know, uh, you more when I first came home. Didn't you didn't sleep, you know? Just even around here, you didn't sleep. You didn't. It was just well, to this day I don't sleep very much. Hell, somebody will say when when were you in Vietnam? I can tell them last night. Most of the time, it's it's a experience that just stays with you. I know a bunch of other guys same way. You're. Tell you, you'll have a. I'll wake up and have to go up and walk around for a while and everything. It'll come back. And there's a lot of things come back. I don't tell a lot of people a lot of things. I won't tell a lot of things what we did because it wasn't fit. It ain't fit to other people to know. And it's something that you just. But yeah, it changed you. It changed you. It changes your. Well, when you're 19, it changes you. The military can change a person's thoughts on war and political violence. Mr. Raider came to the conclusion that war is hell. No, war is, war is hell. Mm. And everything. And no, most of the people who fight in it do not want to, don't want to see it. You know, there's, after you've been there, no. Mm. And everything. The Vietnam War, like any other war, took effect all around the world especially those fighting for their country and the friends and family of those brave people. I think I speak for most Americans when I say we are both proud and eternally grateful for all veterans. Because of your courageousness, I am able to do anything beyond my wildest dreams. So thank you veterans for all you have done.